Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Law and Crime. I'm Jesse Weber, joined here by attorney Terry Austin. We're going to break down the biggest live trials and legal stories in the news today. We're going to be live in multiple courtrooms, a lot of stories, and a big verdict to talk about. So let's get started. Okay, let's break this down. Now, Terry, the jury, my understanding is by finding him not guilty of the first degree murder charge, they're saying that this wasn't uh, premeditated, that but he knew what he was doing. Can you explain it? Right. First degree in Tennessee would be if it was premeditated. But here they're saying it was in connection with the attempted rape of the child. And so they found him guilty of the lesser crime. And felony murder, which is when you are, it's a it's enveloped in that first degree murder. It's when you, again, commit a, uh, a there's a death that occurs as a result of a felony. That's exactly here, right. You know, you also have the trespass. You also have the uh, attempted rape of a child here. Now, I also ha joining me is another special guest, trial attorney Wendy Patrick's here. Now, Wendy, let's talk about what could happen to him. Life in prison. Now, the way I'm understanding this is there's a few things that could happen. Isn't there a mandatory minimum of second degree murder, 15 to 60 years uh, in prison, and whatever he's sentenced to, he has to serve that. But the felony murder, couldn't he get life in prison too? I mean, how do we get, what are his options here? B bottom line, could he ever step foot out of prison again? And the gut reaction would be, we hope not, given the seriousness and the horrific nature of the crime. But as everybody knows, and, and in our business, sentencing schemes can be tricky and they can be fact dependent. In other words, there are sometimes you have one act that can be charged several different ways. They carry several different sentences. It may be up to a judge whether to impose sentences consecutively or concurrently, meaning do they run at the same time or does the defendant spend a longer period of time in custody? My guess in a case like this is between now and sentencing, both sides are going to be looking at what actually happened here that might benefit the defendant from the defense point of view or from the prosecutor's point of view. How can they argue this to be the crime that it was even though they don't have that first degree conviction to work with? Uh, it sounds like the jury discussed, and boy, our hearts go out to what they had to go through in the deliberation room. But discussing the details of what might have happened and how that death and the murder might have come to pass and be thought of when he was already there, perhaps attempting the rape. Very tricky, very technical, but that's what they're going to have to decide between now and sentencing. Yeah, a lot for him and his defense attorneys to consider here. But yeah, I mean, again, some options. It's better for him that he wasn't found guilty of first degree murder, but he was found guilty across the board for the brutal, brutal attack and murder of a 12 year old girl who was just left home alone. It's every parent's worst nightmare. We'll obviously bring you more information once we have it about this case, but I am getting word that right now we can jump live in our first trial of the day. We are live in the Kamaya Hassel case. Let's go live. Okay, we're live right now in the Camille Hassel trial. Uh, Terry, this is an interesting one, a love triangle. We've seen these kinds of cases before. What do you make of the defense pointing the blame at her lover? Apparently there's no love in the courtroom uh, once this trial starts off. Uh, Jeremy Cuellar, what do you make of that? I think it's a good defense because there's someone else they can blame here. And if the motive was the you know, money that was involved, then I think there's a good chance that, that tactic might work here. And also the other reason is because they wanted to continue on with their love fair affair. That's a common one we see many times. Now, Wendy, maybe I can get a quick question from you. What's your perspective on the prosecution's case against this woman? She's not the trigger woman. She's not the shooter, but they're saying she hatched this whole plot. What's your thoughts on the prosecution's case? Jesse, it reminds me of so many other cases we've discussed where you have the defense of one defendant acting under the influence of another. Remember, we saw this even with the Boston Marathon bomber. We've seen this with mm -hmm. lots of very notorious crimes having been committed, where the question for the jury is, but for the influence of the co-defendant, here the lover, which even adds another layer of complexity, would this woman have done what she did? It's tough sometimes when you have this kind of a love triangle, particularly when, as here, this woman did not pull the trigger. But I have to say, Jesse and Kelly, there's an enormous amount of circumstantial evidence here that's backing up the prosecution's case. Very well said, Wendy. And, and we're going to jump back live. I want to let everybody know what's happening right now. On the stand is Fern Nost. I believe her husband, Walter Nost, was just on the stand. And I believe they live near where the shooting occurred. So these are the kind of witnesses you want for the prosecution. What did you hear? What did you see? And how does it link up to the defendants? Let's go back live. So, Terry, I got to say, when you can point the finger at the actual shooter 
and she, her fingerprints would not be on that murder weapon. I mean, she would not be the shooter here, but she helped facilitate this. Uh, clearly, she'd be, you know, that's why the first degree murder charge works here. But when you can point to somebody else, that's got to work for you. That's got to work for you if you're a defense attorney. That's a great defense here, and particularly because there's this love triangle, pointing to the lover is actually the best way to do a defense in this case. And, you know, she's the woman, he's the man. Oftentimes, I think people are thinking to themselves that it's going to be the man who's going to pull the trigger and that the wife might not have it in her to kill her own husband. So I think it's a great tactic. And, Re Wendy, real quick before we go to break, I mean... She was the hus she was this man's wife, and yet she's having an affair with this other man. How could she be so intimately involved with these two people and not know anything that's going on? That's the case for the prosecution. What are your thoughts on that? That's going to be the case for the jury as well. And I got to tell you, witnesses like this uh, who are objective, who are observers, who have no tie-in to any of the players in the game, they make these cases for the jurors because they have no bias. They have no reason to lie. So what they do is really corroborate the prosecution's case here when you have really a conspiracy behind the scenes. It doesn't matter who pulled the trigger, but to make it real for a jury when you don't have her fingerprints on the gun, as you and Terry both point out, these witnesses and these neighbors and the people that actually care enough and remember enough to be able to make the case they sometimes can actually do what the both what both the defendants cannot in terms of clearing themselves. Well, one of the best things for the state is that they have her confession, and I want to talk about if that's a false confession, but not yet. All right, we're learning details about this tragic crime scene. Tyrone Hassel was gunned down on December 31st, 2018, outside of his father's house after this party as he was walking back to his pickup truck around 11 p.m. Um, Terry, one of the interesting things about this case is the prosecution has a slam dunk in a way if you have the defendant herself confessing. They have this confession, but the defense is saying false confession. She was worn down. You can't believe it. What's the law in there? What is it? What's happening? Well, if she was worn down, there is a defense there that it can't be admissible. But clearly here it's up to the judge to determine whether or not that's the case and whether or not they can admit this confession. I think the other issue here is will the prosecution be able to show that she was part and parcel of this with the Snapchats and the conversations that occurred prior to the murder? Yeah, Wendy, if you take the confession out, so for example, if the defense really fights against this and convinces this jury that this confession was coerced, does the prosecution have enough other evidence to say, hey, we can convict her? Yeah, I'll tell you, um, it's, well, it's amazing that this just happened on New Year's Eve and look at what date it is today and we're already in trial. This is, has to be one of the most fast moving murder cases I have ever seen. So to answer your question, it appears that there is an enormous amount of evidence that's been amassed in a short period of time that would allow a jury to look at some of the other circumstances. Now, coerced confession, they're not unheard of, but they're very rare. One of the things the defense is no doubt going to argue here is age. We are looking at young people in their 20s, all three of them, both defendants and the victim. Sometimes we forget about that when we're looking at decorated military um, people like this, and we forget that they were actually very young. And would that factor into whether or not this defendant would be able to be conferred to course into a confession? Did she have enough experience, uh, worldly enough? Would, what did she know one way or another that would allow a jury to believe that? It's a very interesting analysis. But at the end of the day, sometimes juries actually have to watch the dynamic that goes on during these types of confessions to really decide what they believe and don't believe. Well, a lot for them to consider. It's only day two. We're gonna take a break. When we come back, we plan to be live. Stay tuned here on Law & Crime, a lot to cover.